Ship the owner's officer clues while they investigate the section. Sardine jelly and tomato sandwich. Not bad. But check out what quadruple triple double veggie sandwich. You think that's a tall sandwich? I can eat a sandwich my own. Place. A six foot eight sandwich? So, we're going to get to cutting this opal. It has a crack as shown in the original video that goes through here, where I marked with the black lines, and another one in an opposing direction. This one here isn't as deep. This is the most, this is the deepest crack that affects the stone the most. So I'm going to attack it. A little bit of this is going to chip off and it'll leave the main body of the stone. I probably need to get some chips out of this to cut and two decent sized stones, one larger than the other. This is a Lightning Ridge Opal that I purchased back in 2008. It's got multiple layers of fire. It's a really hard decision whether to cut it from the top and go for each color band or go from the side. Everybody's used to seeing stones like that, but not like this. And I think it's prettier, so that's the final decision. I consulted with Len Cram on it, and Justin Thomas as well, as far as what they would do. And they pretty much agreed with me, but in the end, it's down to the artist's eye. And so here we go. Got a nice clean cut along, along most of the crack, eliminating that issue. This piece remains surprisingly. So, it goes along the stone in this direction. I could easily just cap it off, but that's going to waste material. So, I'm going to cut close to, but not along the entire crack itself, because I don't want to steal from the main stone. Just getting it angled just right. I think I'm gonna go. Hard decision. Crack goes through there. Go for some. Cut a little bit deeper than I intended, but I have a nice flaw free stone here. It's going to cut a nice, big, pretty opal. What we've got left is this piece right here. So we might be able to see some of those cool bands if we want, or cut some accent stones, or matching ring stone for a pendant. See how everything turns out. But that's the aftermath of sawing. Alright, so we're gonna use this as the back, it's the flattest portion. There's really no difference in brightness or play of color. In fact, the bands are wider up here. So if I were to cut from this angle. From this side, these crystal bands would get wider 
I cut this way, they're going to get slimmer. They're a little bit dimmer, these clearer crystal bands than the rest of the stone, so it's better off if they go slimmer anyway. And we're just going to cut an uncalibrated oval. That's best for the stone. This is a, most people start with an 80 grit wheel on their machine. That's my 80 grit on the side. I don't really like cutting opal on an 80 grit. I'm just asking for trouble. So. back of it. Got that little chip right there that's still there. We're going to leave that for the moment. I don't want to go too deep yet, I don't think. So we really work out the um, shape of the stone. So I'm going to slowly work the edges down. Give ourselves a decent girdle. Start seeing the stone take shape. That's a pretty good start for a girdle. Might want a little bit thicker. And take off the rough edges there. So, kind of funky looking. If we are perfectionists, we're going to choose to make a symmetrical stone. We're going to lose weight. And if we go for a non-symmetrical stone, that doesn't appeal to as many people. I'm going to go symmetrical as much as possible. I'm going to use the back of the stone to kind of guide me because I want my bands to go straight back and forth across. So, I'm going to work through it. some odd carrot stone to start out with. Obviously it's not going to be anywhere near close to that. Those cracks kind of robbed us, but not very often you see a cool piece like this. I want to try to keep this top area here because it's really dense and it has lots of red fire. So, cut in down here. And we're going to leave a lot of meat off the edge. I'm going to leave a little bit up here. A little bit along that edge. And a little bit off the top. Just getting pretty symmetrical. Just a little bit off. deal with the rest later. I'm going to start forming the dome of the cabochon. Got a lot of funky features to work with here. I'm not going to hop on these edges very quickly. We're going to work down the center. Work that a little bit. We're going to work out towards the edges. Take out those other zones. Alright, got rid of 
rid of that problem area. It's starting to even out. So now we're gonna walk our way around this edge. Trying to keep it at an angle with the rest of the stones at and even out the girdle with that. We got that problem area on the back to deal with, but now we see where it ended up in the stone, so that helps out there. We're gonna go fix that real quick. The rest of that will come out in polishing. And try to ensure that we have a nice even dome. Definitely not going to be any record breakers, but it will be a beautiful stone. I don't like to cut with drop sticks because I like to be able to feel the surface of the stone. I can feel with my fingers a lot quicker than I can see with my eyes, especially with the water on it. Of course, by the end of this, my fingernail is going to look like trash, but I haven't really cared about getting a mani pedi any time in my life, so I don't really have to worry about the beautician ragging on me. That's all we're going to do there. Next we go to my resin wheel. The resin wheel is actually pretty close to what the metal wheel is. So, we'll get similar material removal, but we're actually getting some polishing action. Over here, I'm going to work on my edges. Getting the girdle nice and clean. I'm going to drop a bevel on the back prevent it from chipping when setting. take a stone and you can kind of rotate through it and you can see the uneven edges. It's going to be a bit of a medium to low dome stone, but it's going to work nice with the fire in it because the crystal fire in the center shows up in the center areas show it better with it a little less drastic with the dome. I like to leave a little bit of a girdle. I don't like to leave a sharp girdle. So I bevel it off slightly. It'll remain there, but it'll get softened up a lot as cutting goes on. Rotating through, I can see a little bit of a raised edge over here. I can feel the smoothness before I can even see it with my eyes. Good way to get nice clean hands too. This is a 280 resin wheel at this point. Pretty happy with everything where everything's at. I'm 
still going to get a lot of material removal at the 600 wheel, which is this one. And the 1200 wheel, which will follow after that. As soon as you hit about 3000, the material removal gets less and less, so work out any other major issues here, finer issues there. Might wear a little bit more on these wheels, but what's worth more, a wheel or a stone? Every carat counts. Every carat you grind in the dust is a dollar you don't make, or a hundred dollars, or a thousand dollars, or several thousand dollars. And we have lost a lot of that. A lot of people don't really realize the stones, they see a giant stone and they think that it's going to cut a huge stone every single time. Sometimes I get upwards of 60 to 70 percent return on a cab depending on how it's shaped. Sometimes I get a lot less. That's something you got to consider when you're buying a stone whether the juice is worth the squeeze, this one it was. Something you've got to consider when you're pricing a stone. And it's something that people don't think about when they see a stone that's rough. And they're like, oh, well, it was only X amount of dollars per carat when it was rough. How much is, how can I get so much more? Well, every time you're sitting here cutting on these wheels, you're wearing away the abrasive material that does the cutting. Every time you fire up the motor, it's wear and tear on that motor. And eventually, this machine will die and you'll have to buy a new one. There's electricity running this machine. You're having to pay for that. There's water in the basin. You're having to pay for that. There's material loss, obviously, here. There's your time, which, unless you're a philanthropist cutter, you probably shouldn't work for free. And then there's the fact of how much is it going to cost for you to buy another stone exactly like this one when you sell it. And if you're constantly buying exactly the same thing you sold, you're never going to grow, and that's not business. You're going to be pigeonholed in the same old spot. And then you got to think about life. You can't just cut a stone and sell a stone to replace a stone and break even. you got to pay for gas. you got to pay for electricity, life food, enjoyment, put some money in your bank account, take your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your life partner, whatever, your dog, your cat, out for a good time. Unless you're just doing it for a hobby. And even then, if you're doing it for a hobby, you should treat it like you're doing it for business, because someday it'll probably become that. selling stones, then you got to also think about fees and taxes. Most of the companies like Square, PayPal, they're going to get theirs. And it's going to be a sizable chunk. You also got to think about how much time it took you to source your stone. Did you do all that research for free? That travel? Is that plane ticket just to get some stones? If it was, that goes into the price of your stone. Then you gotta think about the greater picture. How much is this 
how much this drone is going to cost in the future, how much have you lost the rest of the year in your business or in your cutting? Have you gotten feed? That affects the overall price of your entire stock unless you want to go bankrupt. Which most people don't go into business to do that. So most people want you to. figure on a machine like this side lap costs a hundred dollars at least the next wheel costs anywhere from two hundred to three hundred dollars and all the resin wheels cost a hundred to a hundred and seventy five dollars depending on where you get them they're only going to last a certain amount of time I use a 12 to 14 wheel system. So if you extrapolate that amount across all of those wheels, it's a pretty big chunk of change when the count of money comes to the door knocking, and you've got to pay for new wheels. And people are going to want your material cheaper. Everybody wants a giveaway, everybody wants a freebie. You want to be nice, but you do have to think about your own well-being because nobody else will. And just because you may have gotten this rough for a dollar or two dollars doesn't mean that that's the typical value it's going to be. You might have gotten lucky or something like that. Maybe you even got it handed down to you in the family. What is the market value of that stone right now? And what is the market value of that stone going to be when you sell this stone and have to cut another one? People who aren't thinking long term are going to lose. Then you've got to look at the history and pricing of the stones. There could be an artificial bubble in the market. The market for certain stones is sinusoidal. And so it goes up and down over the years. You're not looking at the long term picture. Still, you're just fooling around. for our 1200 grit wheel here. I like to polish the back of my stones. I don't like to leave them rough. That allows the jeweler, or me, whoever, to do an open back setting and the stone doesn't look like crap. At this point, I take that bevel and I round it out. You don't really want sharp edges on your resin wheels. If you see resin scraping off on it, you're doing something wrong. And that's costing you money. It's also putting grooves in your wheels, which are going to groove your stones. Make sure that you do an even motion back and forth, trying to get even wear on your wheels. I'm the first to admit I'm absolutely terrible about it. So you'll find I have a lot of meat left on the outside of my wheels. Not on the inside. 
but I scraped the edge of those wheels and messed up stuff. So, what I end up doing is for harder stones, for dumber cuts, or I might end up scratching my wheel, I'll use the edge of the wheel for that. I'm cutting ruby or sapphire, I'll work it on the edge of the wheel more. And it'll wear down better that way over time. Makes up for my stupidity. background on this stone. I've had this stone since April 2008. I bought it in Dallas, Texas. On my way from California to Georgia. They had more. I wish I'd have bought more. By the time I realized what I didn't buy more of, they had already sold out. And I've held on to this stone ever since, trying to decide what in God's name to do with it. And I misplaced it for about two years. Which is probably good for Remember, this the last wheel of the 1200 where you're going to see any significant material removal. So there's fine tuning, tuning adjustments and things like that. This is where you're going to do it. You don't really want to do any fine tuning over there. You're just going to eat up material. In the end, I choose to sacrifice wheel over material. People often ask how, how long it will take you to cut a stone, or me to cut a stone, it all depends on the stone. Sometimes I can cut a stone in 15 minutes. There's been opals I've taken two weeks to cut. They were that special, and I didn't want muscle fatigue or anything like that to screw up the stone. Been there, done that. No fun. When you screw up that stone, that affects your bottom line. You have to think about that. It's the 3000 grit wheel. I redid my tubes a little bit short on this system, so it's like tug of war. Most of the time, 3,000 grit wheels over here on the standard genie. But I run a little bit different setup. Because I run a lot more wheels. Because Opal turned me into a perfectionist. Time I'm done cutting this wheel or this stone. It'll be finished all the way up to at least 50 nanometers with optical grid polish, which is about the width of a strand of DNA or that blue fire you see there, or violet. That's the size of the silica sphere that caused, well, the size of the silica sphere that caused that fire. It's right around 150 nanometers. Opal isn't a crystal. Even crystal opal isn't a, isn't a crystal. It's just crystal clear, I guess. And it's actually a gel. It's a hydrosilica gel. Australian opal on average is between 3 and 7% water. 
it can be a lot higher. And the higher the water amount is, the more chance the oval has of crazing. Crazing is when you get a crackly surface across the top of the stone, and it renders your stone worthless. Or in cases of large cool stones, it might be good as a specimen, but it's not going to be worth a hundredth as much as it would have been if it hadn't appraised. One way I figured out how to tell if the stone is going to be stable is the specific gravity. The more stable stones are more dense. Research into the mines and the locations and the miners, you'll find out which mines are more stable. But often you don't know where they're coming from. Australian opals are the most stable in general. And that's why they're the most famous and only you've seen the most jewelry. There's opals from other places in the world. Brazilian opal tends to be fairly stable. Some of the opal from Mexico is, some of it isn't. Some of the opal from Honduras is, some of it isn't. Stuff from Java, I've heard mixed reports on, but I haven't cut it myself, so I can't speak to it. Ethiopian opal, the taller opal, it's hydrophane opal. It's very porous. A lot of it you'll see in crazy colors because they filled it with dye or epoxy of dye. And I bought a kilo of chocolate Ethiopian opals back in 2008. I cut that entire kilo, all the seven stones. Went to crap on me and crazed and cracked. And so I call Ethiopian opals Ethiopian dopals. Because crack is black. Yes, they're cheaper. Yes, they're bright. Yes, they're pretty. But just like that really hot girl in high school that looks like a trailer park beauty queen all methed out now, they're not going to last. There'll be very few of these cheap crap Ethiopian stones you see today that are going to be the heirloom stones of tomorrow. And the miners and sellers will tell you all this booty about how they'll cut and how you can cut them. And if you stand on one foot and jump and spin around three times, cut it under a full moon. And sacrifice the chicken the night you cut it, it'll be stable. They're full of crap. And... Any of them that deny it haven't studied soul gel chemistry at all. Soul gel chemistry is the chemistry that rules this stone. It is a soul gel. That's how they synthesize opal. A lot of this is going into research on 3D memory, quantum dots, all that junk. So there's a lot of scientific research out there on synthetic opal, synthesizing opal, the stabilization of it, and all of that that tells the Ethiopian opal sellers that crack is whack and therefore crack. And if they don't like that, that's fine. They can sell their temporary opals and they'll crap out in a few years. And if you cut it and sold it, that's your problem, not mine, I warn you. Your customer can come back to you and can complain to you. And how do you deal with it? It's your business. But, me personally, I like to sell opals. But I know I'm going to give my customers years, decades, if not generations, pleasure. To that end, I don't typically cut any opals straight out of the ground. In 
fact, my first opals I ever cut, I held for almost eight years before I sold them. And now all I cut is old stock and I rotate my stock out. Because I actually care about my customers. In that eight year time, I had three Australian opals, four Australian opal trays. And I had essentially an entire kilo that I cut, so what, 500 grams after cutting, that's 2,500 carats. Go to crap on me. I'm going to take a break as I switch out my final wheels. Alright, so that last set of wheels, we went all the way through 8,000 grit, 14,000, 50,000 custom 100,000 grit that I made. So, other opals out there, there's Virgin Valley Opal. There's one of the mines, which I can't recall its name, which is more of a dry bank mine. It tends to be more stable than the others. Time you'll see Virgin Valley Opal in a glass dome with a rubber stopper and water. That's because it has a high water content. Once it loses that water, it'll craze. Lots of opals found in super wet environments, and that's what you can expect. The drier the environment is, even underground, because the ground can hold lots of water. The drier the environment is, the older the opal is, the more likely it is to be stable. I've cut three pieces of Virgin Valley Opal. I've had zero pieces go bad on me. However, selected those pieces and they were stored dry originally when I got them. Lots of people store their opals, even their Australian opals in water. That's stupid. Unless you're storing it as a specimen, that's great, but it's been stored under water since the day it came out of the mine. I really have no idea how stable that opal is going to be. So you might want to let it dry out. I don't really walk around my opals with, on eggshells or treat them with kid gloves. I treat them like rocks. That's what they are. reality is your customer is not normally going to treat them with kid gloves. They don't want something that they have to do that with. So if you're doing that and it's staying stable and they're not doing that and it's breaking, you've got an issue. Canada has some opal. I haven't had the chance to cut any of it yet. It's quite beautiful. It's more of a boulder opal in most cases. I haven't heard a lot about anything about it. I haven't heard a lot about it in general. I look forward to the uh, cut some. Lots of different common opals around that are cool. There's opal out of Oregon that's very nice. But if you leave any of the nature, if you leave any of the, or if any of the dendrites, a lot of it has dendrites, if you leave it exposed, it's going to craze. So if it has dendrites, make sure they're fully encapsulated. If they're fully encapsulated, you shouldn't have any issues. If they're touching the surface, you've got to cut them out. 
lot of times when you leave the porcelain on the back of your opal, it can cause that. If you have a layer of hard posh in between, there might be a less likely chance of that happening. It all depends. Everybody has their personal preferences in opal. I like Lightning Ridge opal. And I like Andamuka. They're my two favorites. They're not Andamuka, they're meant to be. Next is Andamuka Crystal. Then Boulder. Lambina. Then Cuberpeen. Sometimes Cuberpeen gets an exception. Really bright opals, cool patterned opals, or dark opals. I like those. Go through the spot check. Switching the wheels. This opal weighs 14.5 carats. We started with an opal over 80 carats. We ended up with three pieces out of it, one of which I'm putting now. We're going to be switching wheels soon, so we'll be able to spot check this opal and see where it's at. Mind you, we're on the ultra fine wheels right now. up to 100,000 grit, which for a lot of people is their final polish, that or cerium. I'm not really a fan of cerium oxide as a final polish, because I know I can get finer. And the better the polish is on the rope, the better the fire shines. Often the colors show a lot better saturation, brightness. Obviously, the quality of the surface is strong, that's its value. So, I take mine as high as I possibly can. That's my personal preference. I don't suggest using oil based pastes with opals. It'll cause the stone to cloud up. For God's sake, don't soak them in glycerin or oil, like mineral oil. You're going to run your over. The more crazy crap people do to their over, the chemicals and things that just, I don't know. Over the years, there's been a lot of myths and misconceptions about how to treat these things. A lot of it is not going to be open to Treat them light nicely. Don't thermally shock them. Don't treat them with harsh chemicals. Don't put them in an ultrasound. Don't steam clean them. Soap and water. That's it. Don't walk around and they're going to shatter when you look at them. There's no point in buying one if it's going to be that way. We're going to switch up to the next wheels. So, these are the last three wheels. Cerium oxide, 300 nanometer, 50 nanometer. And that's the bad thing about using fingers, so you gotta be good at catching it with your belly button.
And last wheel of breathing. on a scale just to see what the reality is of the loss here and weight and what we've got left. Got a 14.6 carat stone with the two other pieces, 46.90, figured I'll lose 50% off of this one and 50% off of this one and that was 80 carats originally over. And that's it.